So let's talk about chain reactions a little bit. And I'm going to walk over to the whiteboard and impose on the poor guy running the web uh, video thing here. Uh, sorry for those of you who are standing right there. All right, so here we have a bunch of little circles. Anybody have an idea as to what I'm trying to represent with these little circles? Atoms. So let's say that these are a bunch of U-235 atoms, okay? And a neutron comes in and it splits this one. And this one releases two neutrons and one of them goes off into the surrounding countryside and the other one hits this atom and it releases two neutrons but they both go off into the surrounding countryside. So then the reaction comes to a halt. Okay? So this is what's called a subcritical mass. There isn't enough material there for the fission of an atom to lead to a continuing chain reaction that's exponentially growing. Okay? So, anybody have, there's several ways you could solve that problem and, and get yourself a exponentially growing chain reaction. Anybody who's not already a weapons physicist have a thought as to a way I could solve this problem? To release more neutrons? Well, how would I release more neutrons? Okay. Some boundaries. What? Limit put some boundaries. Yeah. Aha. Okay. So one possibility is I could put something around it. You know, I'm going to use a different color because that one just is not cutting the mustard, as they say. All right. I can put something around it that will reflect these neutrons back in such that they end up hitting atoms and splitting them. Okay, that's called a neutron reflector. Now I've drawn it as though it's like a perfect mirror and the neutrons just reflect absolutely. There ain't no such thing in the real world. Um, the reality is, you know, you can reflect some of the neutrons. You can't reflect 100% of the neutrons with perfect reflection or anything like that. And there are a variety of things that are used as neutron reflectors in nuclear weapons. Uh, a typical thing is beryllium because it does a good job on reflecting neutrons and it's relatively light compared to a lot of things that reflect neutrons. But People have imagined weapons where the neutron reflector is uh, natural uranium, where it's steel, where it's wax. Um, uh, so there are a variety of things that will reflect neutrons to varying qualities and degrees. But in general, having a neutron reflector is a good thing. All right. <clears throat> what else might I do? What's another solution to the, my, my problem of having my neutrons flying off into the surrounding countryside? Pack them closer together. Pack them closer together. Excellent. You guys are going for the two more advanced solutions before we get to the simple solution. But you could pack them closer together. So if you, for example, had some explosives around the outside, if this was a ball of atoms and you had some explosives around the outside and you crushed them to a small, to a tighter density, then if one of them splits, there's a much higher probability that one of those neutrons is going to hit another atom because they're very close together. And in fact, the critical mass that you need, that is the mass that is the minimum to keep one of these chain reactions going, decreases with the square of the density. So if I have, if I have a material where the critical mass is, say, 50 kilograms, and I manage to crush it to twice the density, it's going to be 50 divided by 4, which is 12 and a half kilograms, uh, that will now be the critical mass. If I manage to increase its density by three times, then it's going to be one-ninth of 50 kilograms that will be. And so when you ask the question, how much material do you need for a nuclear bomb, the answer is really, it depends on how clever your explosives designer is and how much he can crush those materials down to a higher density. Okay, so that's, that's another option, is to have them closer together. Okay, what's the simplest option? Lots of material. Right, add more material. So if I have things around here, eventually I will get to the point where when a neutron flies in, you will have an exponentially uh, reacting chain reaction. So the, if, as you might imagine, the best way um, rather than is to have it in a more or less circular arrangement. 
because then there's the highest probability for a given amount of material that the neutron is going to hit something else before it goes off into the surrounding countryside. If you have, for example, a pancake, then there's lots of opportunities for the neutrons to go zooming off before they hit anything. Okay? So the best thing is a sphere. And so the minimum amount of uh, material without any crushing and without any reflecting is called a bare sphere critical mass. Okay? Bare sphere meaning I haven't got anything reflecting the neutrons around the sphere. The sphere is just by itself. Okay? Now, the bare sphere critical mass for 90% enriched highly enriched uranium, that is material that has 90% uranium-235 atoms and only 10% of the other kind of uranium, which is uranium-238, is about 50 kilograms. And I'll tell you the honest truth, I'm having a senior moment and forgetting the uh, bare sphere critical mass for uh, weapon grade plutonium. Uh, I'm thinking about a third of that is probably about 15 kilograms. Anybody remember? 12 or 12? Or okay. I'm going to put a question mark after that. We can check it after the talk. Okay. All right. So we have three things we can do. We can put a reflector on it. We can put more material on it. And we can crush it to a higher density. All right. Those are our three ways to make a nuclear bomb. Okay. Uh, to make the explosive chain reaction. But we have a big problem. We have a big problem with making a nuclear bomb. So let's, let's talk about the just adding more material together. Let's suppose that I had in my bare hands um, a chunk of highly enriched uranium metal that was two-thirds of the bare sphere critical mass that I just talked about. Well, imagine I'm strong. <laughs> Because, you know, 50 kilograms is over 100 pounds. So, you know, having two-thirds of that in one hand would be, you'd have to be reasonably strong. All right? And let's imagine I have two-thirds in the other hand of the amount I need for a critical mass. So between them, they'd be four-thirds of the amount I need for a critical mass. Okay? Now let's imagine I start bringing my hands together like this. What's going to happen? Anybody? Uh, no, but it will start reacting. Because what it turns out that uranium and plutonium both, but especially plutonium, occasionally fall apart by themselves and release some neutrons. So there's always, when you have weapons usable nuclear material around, there are always some neutrons around. So as I bring these two pieces together, a stray neutron is going to fly out from somewhere. And when it gets close enough together that between them in that configuration they are a critical mass, then the reaction will start going, and it will start exponentially increasing if it's slightly above a critical mass, okay? All right, now, what then happens? I'm releasing now 200 million electron volts every time one of these things fissions. So I've got these two chunks of highly enriched uranium in my hands. What's going to be happening? It's going to warm up, right? And uh, it's going to warm up a lot. Uh, and it's going to melt, and then it's going to turn to a gas. And when it turns to a gas, it will start expanding outward, and then we'll have this density problem, right? The atoms will be too far apart, and the neutrons will be whizzing off into the surrounding countryside. By the way, everybody in this room would die <laughs> if I actually did this. I especially would die uh, because of the neutrons that would be released when I did. So that would be what's called a criticality accident. But you wouldn't get any significant explosive yield out of that. You just have a bunch of metal that turned into gas and released a shower of neutrons and killed the people in the room, and it would be considered to be a tragic accident and so on. So. How do you act? So the, the key difficulty of making a nuclear bomb is figuring out how to get that stuff together fast enough that it that it is you know all together before that before it starts blowing itself apart and you actually release a significant yield uh, before it starts blowing itself apart. Okay. Now there are basically two ways to do this. 